Thank you. Thank you, Anna, and, and thanks for the invitation. And in fact, it, it's great to come here because 25 years or so ago, I read a book on permaculture, not really knowing what it was, uh, and ended up the following day joining the Henry Doubleday Research Association. Uh, and I always wanted to come to write in organic gardens, and I never really knew where it was. So this has been uh, um, a good uh, opportunity to come here, although whether I'll get time to see the gardens, I don't know. Let's see. Um, so, uh, when I wrote that title, it must have been at the end of a busy day or something. It's a very busy title. Uh, so, uh, but essentially, what I wanted to do was give a, uh, a flavour, an overview of the kinds of things that we do within the Greenpeace Research Laboratories. Who we are, uh, what we're about, how we fit within uh, Greenpeace as a campaigning organisation, uh, and how we apply... Um, in broad terms, environmental forensic techniques to a wide range of, of different issues. So as Anna said, uh, we're based in the University of Exeter. I'll say a bit more about that uh, later on. But it's been a long um, established uh, relationship, now approaching 30 years uh, within the, uh, the university there. Um, obviously, when people think of Greenpeace initially, probably the kind of things that come to mind is more like what happened yesterday. Uh, outside of BP headquarters, um, the first day of the, the new chief executive, um, where my colleagues wanted to remind uh, BP of uh, the existence of uh, climate change and the need to uh, perhaps um, adapt. So I think they, uh, they blocked uh, the entrance in with some solar panels as well um, to, uh, to make the point. And of course, uh, you know, that's the view, the vision that a lot of people have of Greenpeace, we're a campaigning organisation, uh, we're doing actions, we're out there um, trying to capture people's attention. And that is, of course, a big part of what Greenpeace is doing in order to raise awareness uh, and get the messages across and get people thinking. But of course, it, behind the scenes, there's a lot of other parts to Greenpeace. It's quite a complicated organisation. Uh, it's not just about the activism and about the uh, the actions themselves. Um, we have people from all range of different uh, occupations working for the organisation, uh, including uh, us scientists based in, uh, in Exeter. So we're not the only scientific uh, trained staff within Greenpeace, but it's the only location where we have a research group, research facility. There's nothing else like it for Greenpeace anywhere else in the world, and as far as we're aware, it's unique amongst the NGO community for an organisation to have um, committed to and funded this kind of research establishment over such a, a long period. So it was established in the late 80s um, at my old university, in fact, although I didn't know them at the time, uh, Queen Mary College. Uh, and in fact, the person who set it up, Paul Johnston, he's still there, still um, my close colleague uh, all those years later. Uh, it began, in fact, when Greenpeace UK, uh, which is based in London, of course, wanted to have some understanding of all of the different pollutants that were going into the waterways around the UK. Uh, so they did a tour of the UK um, with a ship called the, well, a boat called the Beluga, um, quite a small boat, uh, tried to run a mass spectrometer on board. I think it had limited success, um, but uh, nonetheless, it was the start of something which has uh, grown from there. So since uh, the early 90s at the University of Exeter, um, we have uh, status there as uh, honorary fellows, so we, we have our honorary appointments, but that doesn't uh, in fact in, in impact on what we are able to research. So just like any other research group in the university, we can design and conduct our own research, and of course it's also up to us to defend that research. So we don't, get, um, we don't hide behind the university, we're very clear all the time about who we are uh, and what we do. Uh, but obviously that link being in the university is very useful. Um, it gives us access to uh, a lot of expertise, uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure. And we also enable others within the university, not only in Exeter but elsewhere, to make use of our um, expertise and, and equipment that we maintain. So that is the entirety of the Greenpeace Research Labs, um, plus a couple of other people. So Paul Johnston is the, the guy who set it up in the late 80s. He's a toxicologist. Um, I'm not sure who this guy is. Uh, I'm a, a marine and freshwater biologist uh, originally. Uh, then we have um, my colleague Irina, 
um, in the middle here. So uh, Irina is from Ukraine <coughs> and uh, she's an organic chemist but also acts as one of Greenpeace's radiation safety advisors. Uh, and she has a lot of personal experience of uh, work around um, Chernobyl and the areas that have been impacted, um, not least because it's an area that she grew up in. So, um, Kevin Brigden is uh, uh, a metals chemist um, who's done a lot of work also uh, on um, corporate dialogue with uh, electronics and textile companies trying to understand their use of chemicals and, uh, and the opportunities to move away from them. Uh, Reyes is not based in Exeter. She looks a bit like a film star there. Yeah. Um, Reyes is a, a terrestrial ecologist, a specialist in um, agriculture, sustainable agriculture. So perhaps you know she should have been the one coming to speak today, but uh, she's based in Spain. Um, she does a lot of work these days on the links between uh, land management, um, uh, water protection, and also uh, climate um, aspects. Uh, and then in terms of other core staff, we have uh, Melissa Wang. Uh, <coughs> Melissa is also a chemist. Um, she uh, trained originally in Nanjing, um, and she's been working with us now for uh, almost uh, 10 years. Uh, and Melissa is one of our chemists, but she also does a lot of international uh, work at the interface between science and, and policy. Um, so uh, she'd be quite pleased with, uh, with that picture, I guess. Um, Ildiko is our newest member of staff. Um, Ildiko comes from Budapest. Uh, she um, has done a lot of work as a plastics chemist um, in uh, academia, but also before that in industry. Uh, but she's coming to run our LCMS um, system for complex analysis. Um, Mo, apologies to Mo for the photograph. Mo's our research administrator. Um, she also occasionally doubles up as a lab technician um, because she likes to, to keep her hands on, the, on that side of it as well. Um, and Aidan uh, comes from a different background. He's a, an air quality modeler. Uh, so he brings a totally different range of expertise to the group. Um, but uh, he's been with us now for uh, just over a year um, and looks after a lot of our air monitoring equipment as well. We've got equipment for monitoring um, particulate pollution, acid gas pollution, uh, but he is fundamentally a, a modeler. And then Bea is also quite new. She's um, our uh, formal laboratory technician. So we've now got three days a week, uh, something that we haven't had for 30 years, which is a technician to help us in the lab, which is fantastic. Uh, and she's also um, training up on some of the analytical techniques that we have. Now, there are two other people here that I haven't mentioned, um, and they are very closely affiliated with us, but they're not... Um, uh, officially on staff. Um, Kirsten is a cetacean biologist and she's currently down in Antarctica and I'll show you some of the things she's up to. Uh, and Catherine is a writer so she's one of the um, sub-editors for Nature but she's worked a lot with us preparing um, technical reviews and reports. Um, so it's a fairly small family, quite a sort of diverse range of, uh, of different backgrounds um, but we all come together uh, at various times. Uh, most of us are based in in, uh, in Exeter, in the university there. Um, like most things these days, we have a, a mission statement, and ours is very simply to apply science to inform Greenpeace's campaigns. Now, I think when this was originally uh, drafted, um, some people within Greenpeace itself wanted that to say, apply science to support Greenpeace's campaigns. And we've always maintained that our role is to inform. It's our role to bring the science, not simply to try and provide um, support for what the campaigning side of the organisation is doing. And what that means is that we're often having quite difficult conversations within Greenpeace. Um, campaigns have their own momentum, uh, campaigners are very passionate, uh, and sometimes when the science comes up against that, uh, we end up having quite uh, uh, long and, uh, and tricky conversations. But our role is always to um, defend the science, uh, and if we didn't do that, then we might as well pack up and, 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 and go and do something else. And all of our staff have come to uh, the campaigning organisation from a scientific research background. So we've all had our careers in science, we're bringing that to Greenpeace rather than being Greenpeace activists who are trying to, to do science. Um, one of the oldest um, parts of Greenpeace's wider mission statement is the concept of bearing witness. So this is a uh, an old Quaker tradition, if you like, of just telling things as they are, uh, very peacefully bearing witness to what is going on. 
And although we're doing that using lots of uh, quite complex machinery, we see that what we're doing essentially is bearing witness through science. So that's our, our broader mission statement, um, which is uh, largely as you'd expect, um, providing our own expertise, overseeing other scientific work that goes on within Greenpeace, doing that engagement with the scientific community uh, in order to do collaborative research, in order to get access to other um, expertise. Uh, we've performed this kind of radar function, if you like, looking out at the horizon, seeing what else is, is out there coming up uh, that Greenpeace may need to be aware of and respond to. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, a number of us represent Greenpeace um, International at various um, uh, policy interfaces. So these would be international treaties and conventions where there's a, a role for NGOs, civil society organisations. Uh, so more broadly, um, uh, we do our research, which is very environmental forensics focused. Um, rather than having a huge throughput of samples for a limited range of analyses, we tend to have a smaller um, number of samples perhaps than lots of commercial labs, but we try and squeeze them for as much information as we can get because they're often coming from places that are difficult to access, um, maybe uh, areas that are quite sensitive to work in, uh, so we really try and get as much information as we can out of the, uh, the samples. Uh, we do a lot of training within the organisation as well because obviously we can't be everywhere to collect samples of everything. So we do skill shares and, uh, and other training events uh, to keep people safe in the field. And a lot of external work, not just with, um, uh, with companies uh, and at that interface with, uh, with decision makers, but also of course with the media. Um, it's, uh, whether that's reactive in a sense of there's been an incident or more proactive when we've got something uh, new to, uh, to say. So it's quite a, a broad remit um, that we have and of course we're working globally so Greenpeace has more than 40 offices around the world uh, and it's feasible that at any one time we may be working with any one of those um, and in fact at the moment I think when I looked a few days ago we've got active projects with 25 of Greenpeace's offices around the world at the moment within our group. Now that doesn't mean we're doing all of the work, but it does mean we're trying to kind of juggle all of those different things. Um, we've got a website if you're interested. Um, most of our stuff is, is up there um, uh, that, that, that's just freely downloadable, unless of course it's, it's in a journal that's, uh, that's paywalled, but then you've got a link to it. Scienceunit.greenpeace.org. Um, it's the most basic website around these days um, because, um, well, I'm the webmaster, so uh, um, it's never got any better. Uh, but, you know, we have to live with that. But if you um, have a look through there, if there's anything you can't get hold of, then let us know. And we also have a presence on social media, although that's pretty poor as well. So we're, we're always up for any advice or, or help in terms of um, learning how to use social media. Um, so, our analytical capabilities, very similar in fact to a lot of the things that Anna's been showing me um, this morning. In fact, some of the equipment is identical. Uh, so, GCMS was uh, for a long time our core um, and uh, we also had an ICP OES, so we were doing work on metals with uh, optical um, spectrometry, spectroscopy. Uh, now we have an ICP MS, the same one as you have down the corridor. Uh, and we have an LCMS system, the same as you have down the corridor, uh, for doing uh, work on uh, persistent organic pollutants, um, especially some of the more water-soluble pesticides and veterinary drugs, um, and uh, also for unknowns analysis. So with the, the Orbitrap system, uh, you're able to look at, with a very high resolution, um, at the mass and start to discern other contaminants that are there in the environment that uh, nobody is looking for. Uh, in the last few years, we've done a lot of um, FTIR, infrared. Um, plastics have been the thing of the moment. Uh, I'd like to say we were ahead of the curve, um, but uh, uh, which we kind of were initially, but then, of course, Blue Planet 2 came along, and everyone refers back to that as the moment that everyone realised that plastics were an issue, but there we go, never mind. That's great. Uh, and we do a lot of um, maintenance and provision of other equipment. Uh, and of course, we can't do everything ourselves, so we do work with uh, other leading laboratories, other universities, um, commercial labs when we need to, to get access to the different uh, uh, equipment. But if you were come to come to our labs, and anyone who's down in Exeter is always very welcome to come and have a look, it would look like a chemistry lab. I mean, these things look the same wherever you go. 
and we have to follow the same standards of, uh, of sample preparation um, and, uh, and maintenance on the equipment. Um, and one thing that I think we've made a commitment from a long time ago that we have service contracts on all of our, our, our machines, which on the outset is quite expensive, but um, you often find in universities that there are bits of equipment that are bought for a project and then that's it, they get used and then they, they sit in a corner. Um, and we've made a point that because all of this equipment, every single piece of equipment we have has been bought with Greenpeace supporters money. None of it is grants, none of it comes from uh, any um, corporate sources, um, none of it from government, none of it from other NGOs, it's all from um, supporters. Uh, so we have to look after it, we have to make sure we're using it, and we have to keep it maintained. And on balance, uh, that's been the best way of doing it. So just some examples of the work that we do. Um, GCMS, uh, we found Agilent is a, still a very good system for, uh, for their GCMS systems. Um, and some of ours are now more than 20 years old, but they're still operating. Uh, and for example, we can apply those to specific cases uh, this was uh, a study that we presented at the Dioxin meeting um, last year, uh, looking at uh, landfills um, in, uh, in Poland uh, that were seemingly quite often catching fire. Uh, and the story behind this particular one is that there were a lot of unregulated wastes that were turning up at this site that would gradually build up, and then every now and again there would be a mysterious fire. Um, things would, uh, would be destroyed and it was then very difficult to uh, trace the evidence. Uh, one of the things that is very positive in terms of working with Greenpeace as a global organisation is that, of course, in all of those countries in which we operate, we have people who know the local area, speak the, the language, know the contacts, have contacts with scientists, with government, uh, which means that we're able to access some of these places um, that would otherwise be quite difficult if we were just sitting in the UK and thinking mm, we should be working in that area. Uh, very contaminated samples, uh, lots of uh, chlorinated organics, um, some of them products of combustion, some of them we think uh, residues of materials that were being um, taken in and stored on that site. And it, it looks like it was being used as a way of importing and disposing of hazardous waste from uh, a variety of different industrial operations, perhaps even outside of Poland. That's something that we're still investigating at the moment. Uh, now, we're not able to do analysis for dioxins and furans, so we use a, an external lab for that, um, but again, some very high concentrations of uh, PCBs um, and, uh, and furans, at least, uh, adding to the, uh, the TEQ for um, some of those ashes and soils. So that's just one example. We, we can apply our, our methods to... Uh oh, yeah, no, I put this... <laughs> I took this yesterday. We've just had... Um, <laughs> a hydrogen generator installed, and I thought it looked pretty cool. So uh, um, we're trying to move away from helium, uh, because with helium being now so expensive, not, not a renewable resource. Um, so this is our first <laughs> try at uh, using hydrogen as a carrier gas um, to try and get around that. So uh, yeah, anyway, there we go, slight distraction. Um, that's our orbit trap system. You'll see one down the corridor. Um, this is, as I say, a very versatile instrument. What we've done with it mostly so far is uh, analysis for targeted um, pesticides and veterinary drugs uh, and uh, looking at um, use of pesticides on a landscape level. So what can we see <coughs> in the waterways? What can that tell us about the different types of products that are still in use or are, are flushing through from the soil? Um, how does rainfall influence that? Uh, and uh, we published a method uh, a couple of years ago where we were using our system to look at just over 250 pesticides um, in, uh, in a single run, um, using both positive and negative uh, injections, um, and, uh, and also looking at a range of veterinary drugs. And initially we tested it on some areas that were quite familiar to us. Um, in fact, the River Culm is just down the road from where I live. Uh, and uh, in fact, the River Culm ended up on the cover of... Uh, Analytica Chemica Acta. It was one of those things where they kept hassling us for an image for the paper, so I stopped on my way to work and took a photo with the iPhone, and there we go, ended up on the front of the journal. Um, but beyond that, once we'd established the methods, uh, then uh, the following year, 
we went out and uh, used our network of people that have been trained across um, our European offices and they each went and collected a number of snapshot samples from rivers um, around uh, Europe just to give us an instantaneous picture of the complexity uh, of uh, environmental contamination with uh, this range of, of, of chemical types. So um, I won't uh, go into the detail here, but you'll see that the blue bars here are just simply the number of different uh, pesticides that we identified in those different samples, uh, and the red ones are the veterinary drugs, um, obviously fewer of those detected, but uh, quite prominent in, in some locations, and always dealing with quite complex mixtures. And what we tried to do on that basis then uh, is to look at the, uh, not only the concentrations of individual substances, uh, looks like something's gone a little bit wrong on the side here, sorry about that, I've lost some substances, but the top one here, MCPA, so chlorophenoxyacetic acid, very widely used, very mobile, I mean, no surprises that that would be one of the most abundant ones still, um, but quite a range of other things, including um, the pesticides themselves, but also the adjuvants that are there um, in the mixture that are coming through in the rivers. <coughs> sometimes at PPB levels, uh, sometimes uh, often, of course, uh, below that down into the PPT, but always uh, present as a complex mixture. And of course, if you start to look at the risk quotient, if you start to add those up uh, and look at uh, the way in which that um, uh, comes out for uh, risk to uh, some of the most sensitive species, uh, many of the locations, I think there were 13, yeah, 13 samples gave us a risk quotient above one for that particular snapshot moment of sampling. And that's not because of one particular um, agent, it's because of the, the mixture um, that's there. Now, of course, there are lots of ways in which you can calculate risk quotient. Um, but uh, this is just an illustration, um, choosing one of the most common ways of doing it. And uh, clearly there's a, an issue there that you would miss if you were just looking for one or two of the individual components. Uh, I've said we do a lot with, um, with plastics. So this is our uh, Perkin Elmer FTIR system. It's a Spotlight 400, so it's a, um, an imaging microscope. Although I have to say we tend to use the point and shoot mode much more often than the imaging because imaging takes a huge amount of time. And unless you're certain that everything is in the right focal plane, you can waste a lot of time and energy collecting some fairly uh, low quality data. Uh, we've also got a, a small ATR system that can carry around with us, um, which we do for field work, but also to bring it out to other people. So I don't know if you recognize where that is. Um, that's in the members dining room at the House of Commons um, at an event last summer when we had lots of politicians that came in to learn about the work that we've done uh, across the UK in the, in the rivers. So uh, that's Polly, she travels around with me. Um, and the idea with the, the rivers work came out of <coughs> some work that we did in 2017 around the coast of Scotland uh, using a little mantanet. Uh, this is the Beluga 2, so this is a slightly bigger boat than the original Beluga. Um, but going around and just collecting samples from a, a range of locations, looking at duplication of samples over time to see the variability, uh, and also calculating the exposure that uh, basking sharks would be getting, because this is, these are areas that were frequented by the, the basking sharks. Um, so, but of course we know that it's not just a problem at sea. We hear a lot about marine plastics, but of course they don't often start, uh, some of them do, some of them don't start at, uh, at sea. Um, so we wanted also to look up into freshwater. Um, and obviously, you know, this is a scene that you could see on many, many rivers around the UK, sadly. Um, but what is often not so visible, of course, are the, uh, the microplastics. Uh, so that's a, a caddis larva. Uh, with bits of, of plastic in its, uh, uh, in its, uh, um, in its test. Uh, so this was work we did last year. Um, right about this time last year, uh, we had teams out sampling. Again, a snapshot. This wasn't, we're not able to put a, a, you know, a huge amount of, of resources to focus on all of these rivers for a long period. So they were just looking to see what was coming by at the time uh, in order to focus research more in the future. Um, 30 locations uh, from this time last year. And what we prepare within the research labs is the technical report that doesn't look very glossy but has all of the information in about the, um, the, the analyses themselves. And then on the basis of that, the campaign produces something which is much more accessible for a wide range of people um, to be able to see the results. 
That's the system we were using. It's a small uh, portable Mantanet, uh, very easy to carry around and very easy to deploy. Um, we called it the Silver Dragonfly. Um, and that just streams out behind in the river and uh, um, you deploy it with a, a flow meter at the front. Uh, you know what volume of water you've swept. Uh, and obviously in this case what we're looking for are the, the larger pieces of microplastic. So down to around about one third of a, a millimeter. Um, it's only going to be a fraction of what's in the river because we're only at the very surface. Of course, we're not picking up what's down below. Uh, but the results were interesting nonetheless. Um, and of course, as is typical with microplastics in water, every sample is unique. Um, the concept of what is a duplicate sample is, is tricky because these things are discrete contaminants and the, the, the pollution levels vary so much over time. Uh, but all of those samples came back to us uh, in Exeter for us to sort through. Um, and uh, so that's what we were receiving were honey jars um, full of debris uh, and we then uh, manually worked through over many hours picking out anything that could be a candidate material uh, and then using the uh, FTIR system uh, in order to uh, pull out the things that, uh, that were, were plastic amongst them. And from the campaign perspective the information is just gathered up in a easily digestible way so what they were most interested in was the total number of pieces that we found what size ranges they were in, what types of materials that, uh, that are there. So obviously, um, you know, doing the science is one thing, but then what we've got to be able to do is to check that the, what they're pulling out in terms of messages is something that is defensible scientifically as well. And, I mean, among the, the more interesting scientific um, aspects, I mean, obviously this is a, what we call a nurdle. It's a, a pellet, pre-production pellet. We're finding plenty of those um, in some rivers, especially on the Mersey, uh, but lots of other fragments, different types of plastics. And these were turning up very frequently. You know what those are? Those are biobeads from sewage treatment plants. And they're made of low-grade uh, polyethylene, uh, but they're perfect size for um, wading birds to pick up, like a, a little snack. So what we've started to do is combine the um, plastics work with the, the, the forensic um, chemicals work and look at the chemical burden of each of these individually. So we've taken a range of them and just looked at them as individual packages of, uh, of contamination. And interestingly, though perhaps not surprisingly, every single one is different. So you'll have a different range of metals, you'll have different organics associated with these things. Uh, and these are very widespread because when sewage treatment works over top uh, or when the filters aren't working properly, a lot of these are being washed out um, and are almost indistinguishable from uh, um, other bits of organic material that birds might be eating. And here's another interesting thing that we found. Um, microbeads, of course, now subject to restrictions. We still find some of these older polyethylene microbeads, probably in old products, um, possibly still in sewage treatment works or being resuspended in the water. But we were also finding other ones that had a much softer consistency. Same size range, perhaps a little bit smaller, same colour, same appearance. Um, and those have very similar infrared spectra as well, but they're paraffin wax. And we think that what's happening in some cases is that when products are being reformulated, they're being reformulated to use these paraffin wax microbeads. Is that a benefit in terms of environmental... Uh, improvement? I think it's hard to say. And with the paraffin wax, of course, perhaps the potential for them to absorb chemicals from the environment and concentrate them up may be even greater than for polyethylene, but uh, we'll see. Now, in some places, of course, it's a lot easier to see the plastics problem. Uh, and we've been working with our office in, um, in Malaysia for some time to try and expose the problems with the waste trade. And just a couple of weeks ago, of course, Malaysia made some quite important announcements that they were returning some of this stuff to sender. Uh, I'd like to say it was partly because of the work we've been doing. I've got no idea. I mean, it's, uh, you never really know. Um, but lots of rudimentary recycling going on. Uh, lots of piles of, of this kind of material all over the place, um, sorted in various ways. And of course, sometimes, um, either deliberately or accidentally, uh, you get this kind of thing happening. Um, <coughs> so we've also been... Uh, analyzing the ash from some of these fires because um, it's never then disposed of, it's just left to blow around and, uh, and contaminate um, the area. Those results are still, still to come. Uh, 
But the interesting thing is that despite the fact that there is clearly a pro problem here with plastics, what's really made a difference in connecting people in the government is the fact that we can find microplastics in the water. Now you'd think if you were faced with a problem like that you would know there was an issue. And yet somehow when we presented these data and said look at all the different mix of plastics that you've got there, um, each one of these we can analyse and, and look at the chemical constituents and that made a difference because I think water connected much more with people than the big piles of plastic on, on land. So we've also done some work um, in, uh, in Europe on microplastics in, uh, uh, in rivers looking at the smaller fractions. So in the UK we've looked um, at the, the larger microplastics uh, in uh, the Czech Republic, Republic we we're taking whole water samples and filtering those um, from three locations uh, in Prague and also uh, downstream where before the river flows into the Elbe. Uh, and as you may expect, no real surprises, we we're finding quite a range of different uh, materials um, there in the, uh, in the river. And in fact, what, what did surprise us was just the, the breadth of the different types of materials that we were finding. Um, so that's across all of the different samples. Uh, you can see that uh, um, we've got here modified cellulose. We, we tend to pick up quite a lot of cellulosic material, but it's clearly not natural uh, in its natural form. It's either bright red or bright green or bright blue, and it's extruded uh, to a very uniform cross-section. Uh, it's clearly been you know, produced as a, a man-made fibre, but it still turns up quite a lot. Um, in the samples, but also a mix of other um, fragments and fibres and things that are, that are out there as well. And always a number of things that are quite clearly polymeric in their structure uh, and their spectra, uh, but we simply are not able to put a, a, a definite um, identity on it. And I'm not sure at this stage, having spoken to some other groups, just how often these things are just not reported and just how often the cellulose also is not reported. It's like, oh, well, it's cellulose, it must be a natural material. And we may be missing something there, which I'll, I'll come back to uh, in this case. Because we've also applied the same kinds of techniques um, in Antarctica. Of course, you find lower concentrations, but you do still find them. Um, we've sampled waters um, for three years in a row now from the same locations around the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so that's uh, this part up here, of course. Um, four locations, um, very simple sampling. The key thing here, although the sampling and the analysis is not too difficult, the quality control to avoid contamination um, is the, the big thing in this case. Um, but, uh, and also getting the samples back from Antarctica, that's, that's interesting. Um, but again, you find a range of uh, different things. Uh, in this case, we found a lot of cellulose. Um, and we suspect that, this, I mean this is all from surface samples of, of water in the area, there's a lot of cruise ships that go there, there's a lot of fishing vessels, um, there are quite a lot of research stations on land and they're all washing, clothing, other laundry uh, and I suspect that what we're picking up with the cellulose is quite a lot of cotton fibres that are going in. Now is that significant in toxicological terms, in terms of impact? We know from other work that cellulose is taken up by, by species, but we don't know the implications of that. So when we're looking at um, polymers in, in the general term, we've got to keep a mind on the fact that we, we, you generally find in environmental samples a lot of cellulose that's been coloured, extruded, uh, and is obviously coming from some kind of woven fabric. Um, and now what we're also trying to do is look at some of the, uh, the solutions that are being proposed. So. Uh, plastic free aisle in a supermarket that looks distinctly not plastic free. So we're starting to look at uh, building up a database of, uh, of, of different biopolymers, degradable plastics, um, using a combination of um, FTIR, uh, but also um, building up a, a database of mass spectra using our new pyrolysis system. Um, so the two lines of evidence uh, we're using in order to verify the nature of those polymers that companies are using um, and uh, how much we can tell the difference between different grades of, uh, of polymer using those different methods. Now I mentioned that we allow our equipment to be used by others within the university so this is our main um, analytical lab uh, and these are all students from biosciences. Uh, 
this, uh, uh, this is Jen. She's working on microplastics on beach sediments in the Galapagos Islands. Um, Steph uh, is looking at some microplastics in sewage sludge in the UK. Uh, Elliot, whose head you can just about see, um, is uh, investigating uh, microplastics in beach sediments from Cornwall. Uh, and Lara is uh, doing the same thing, but from estuaries in Brazil. Um, and uh, all using the infrared equipment that we've got there. But you can see the, um, the, the other equipment that we've got packed in. Just like I was quite pleased that your labs are so crowded because yeah, ours are as well. Um, so some of the collaborative work we've done working with uh, others in the University of Exeter, including at the Penryn campus um, with the, the turtle group down there. Uh, the, our equipment was used in order to look at microplastics in the stomachs of a range of different turtle species. Uh, and perhaps, again, unsurprisingly, it's the Mediterranean that comes out um, with the loggerheads and the green turtles there as being particularly contaminated. Um, and then moving on, a uh, similar group, they looked at uh, microplastics in the guts of um, stranded um, cetaceans and seals. Uh, and obviously, th these were all carcasses that were washed up um, that were then sampled in the gut contents. And again, perhaps unsurprisingly, but um, uh, interestingly, um, polymers in a lot of those as microplastics. Uh, and since then, um, those groups have begun to look more in detail at exposures, uh, exposure routes. So this was published um, just at the end of 2018, early last year, um, looking at uh, the relationship between the evidence of different prey species in the gut and the presence of microplastics with some indication of some associations. I mean, I, I must admit, we did have some conversations about the strength of those correlations, but uh, um, there's clearly yeah, something going on there. Uh, and then also, more recently, looking at, uh, uh, with Kerry Lewis's group, looking at uh, mussels uh, and the, the breadth of different um, types of, uh, of, of, of microplastic in the different media. So in the water, um, compared to the sediment, of course, you get quite different partitioning. Um, that's very different, again, from the macroplastics that you find on the beaches. Uh, and that's markedly different, again, from mussels that are collected in the same area. And one interesting thing here is that it looks like the mussels have got a real preference for cellulosic fibres. They seem to pack those in. Uh, now, is that because they're um, preferentially holding on to those um, and rejecting the others? We really don't know at this point, but it's uh, quite an interesting distinction. And at the moment, we've got a lot of other research going on with, um, with other groups. So with Cardiff University, we're using their um, frozen database of otters, um, where they, the, uh, Cardiff is the place that gets the otters from roadkill all around the UK. Uh, and we're working with them in order to uh, look at microplastics in the gut. And also with other researchers at Cardiff to look at microplastics in um, dipper feces and uh, dipper regurgitate, uh, and again, finding those. And other, uh, the, the one in the middle um, there is, uh, we, we've got some work going on with the British Antarctic Survey where they're coming down and using our equipment to look at microplastics in krill. So it's not just research that we do, but also uh, we get involved in um, looking at, uh, at the literature in a, in a broader way. And of course, one of the big issues with marine plastics is fishing gear. Uh, it's a universal problem, unfortunately. Um, and one of the things I've been doing recently is um, co-authoring uh, one of the UN group of experts reports um, looking at sea-based sources uh, of marine litter, trying to come up with better estimates. Um, and I've been focusing in particular on waste dumping as part of that, which is um, something I've been following for a long time. Okay, so we don't just do wet things. Um, we also have our air pollution uh, work that we do. So these are some of the devices I was talking about for air monitoring. But also with Aidan's expertise, we're able to look at uh, uh, modelling data, modelling studies. And this is from something he was doing, looking at the proposed, uh, or the impact of proposed coal plant developments um, in various parts of the world. Uh, that's in Indonesia. Um, and, uh, but yeah, we provide those uh, bits of equipment. And, and of course, some of these are uploading data to a, a network that we can then look at from wherever we are. Uh, and we can combine the different techniques. So this was a study we did last year looking at uh, a coal-fired power plant 
um, in Bulgaria, uh, very close to a village. You can see the power plant here, uh, and this is the, uh, the center part of the, the village. Um, and we were able to look both at exposure to air pollutants um, and to show that when the wind was blowing from the power plant direction, the concentrations of particulates and of NO2 uh, went up, uh, and SO2 in particular went up quite significantly. Um, but at the same time, we were interested in what happens to the coal ash that comes from that power plant. So this is the coal ash dam. Um, so the village is, uh, is up here, the power plant. Uh, there's a huge dam here with uh, coal ash. Uh, that goes through what's called an equaliser facility, which is just adjusting the pH, but then the runoff is just going straight into the river system. So we were looking at metals and contaminants um, from the coal ash going into that river system, which is something that's going to be published quite shortly. Uh, and then because of Irina's connection, I mentioned about her connection with Chernobyl. Um, she's actively involved in research over a number of years with research institutes, almost the equivalent of this research institute, but in Ukraine. Uh, and she's been looking at cesium um, in milk and uh, in foodstuffs. Uh, again, relying on local contacts of Greenpeace um, who know the people who are able to work with the communities in order to collect samples of milk. Uh, and we're now just about to um, submit a paper for publication looking at strontium in grains um, grown in the area, grains and, and also in wood. And of course next year will be an interesting year and there's research planned already for this location, another significant one in terms of radioactive, uh, taken from a long distance away, hence the graininess. That's Fukushima. Um, right, looking at the time, I'm just going to skip through a few other things uh, quickly. So. We don't do any active research work on seabed mining, uh, although we did try last summer and uh, unfortunately um, we had a problem with the, uh, the ROV um, that we were going to use. But this is an area where we're being called upon to provide lots of different uh, um, expert input from our experience of, uh, of dealing with these kinds of issues. Uh, so we published a couple of papers looking at the range of impacts uh, and perhaps some of the strategies that, are, that could be put in place to, uh, to look at um, assessing seabed mining as an issue. But of course what's come up very recently is the whole issue of how we meet the demand for electrification of vehicles um, given that metals are at a premium uh, and there's lots of arguments that we have to mine the seabed in order to um, provide the battery power required. So one of the things that Kevin, my colleague Kevin, has been doing is pulling together all these different pieces of evidence uh, looking at metal supply, looking at mining impacts, looking at impact of seabed mining, looking at the projections that are there for electrification of the transport system, and just seeing where the gaps are, where the, the critical things are in terms of battery technology. And it turns out that the two key things really are cobalt and nickel, and cobalt especially is going to be a, a crunch point into the future. Uh, I've said that we work at um, the International Convention, so this is my colleague Melissa uh, at a UN meeting. Um, and in a few weeks' time, I'll be going to the meeting of the London Convention and Protocol. So I've, I've represented Greenpeace there for almost 25 years now. Uh, and one of the papers that I'll be presenting is a critique of something that's being proposed um, in Denmark, which is this uh, decarbon ice technology. So the idea is that uh, ships would have a system on board that would be able to capture and compress the CO2 and would dispose of it in solid blocks into the deep sea. Um, and uh, that's something that we're a bit concerned about being proposed as a green technology. Um, so that's one of the, the, the kinds of things that we do in terms of taking um, technical reviews to these uh, policy processes. And you may have seen last year that there was quite a big hoo-ha with Greenpeace going out to um, identify the problems um, that Shell wants to leave behind out in the, uh, the North Sea. Um, but of course, behind that, there's also work on a policy level uh, that I'm involved with at the relevant uh, international convention, the OSPAR convention. So yes, there's the actions, but there's also what goes on behind it. And I'll just finish with a few photographs of what's going on right at the moment uh, in Antarctica. Uh, we've had a ship tour that's been going on for uh, almost a year now starting at the, uh, in the Arctic, doing various bits of research um, on the way down, looking at uh, overfishing, looking at plastics, documenting um, biodiversity around the, uh, the Amazon reef. Uh, and now we have two ships in Antarctica. 
the Esperanza, which is a great ship for working on, good science platform, and the Arctic Sunrise, which is an icebreaker and is much more wobbly, but uh, nonetheless a good platform to work on. And this has been done with uh, a lot of um, collaborative work, um, working with uh, Stony Brook um, University um, in the US to um, help them get to Elephant Island, which is just uh, some way north of the, the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, um, in order to look at the uh, populations of chinstrap penguins. So we set up a base there um, for some time so that they could do those surveys. Um, this is my colleague Kirsten. She came up on the, one of the first slides. So she's been doing surveys for cetaceans, um, visual surveys following very strict methods and finding, of course, these guys um, in areas that have not been monitored before now. And we've also got acoustic um, equipment on board to be able to do towed array, uh, one of the ships in motion so we can look and, and document distribution of these uh, species. This is very prospective work, so we, we've got equipment on board uh, where we're helping uh, one of the European projects to look at eDNA, so environmental DNA samples. We're there, it's easy enough to collect the samples, so why not? Um, we've been collecting them from the surface and at the same locations collecting them from depth with sterilised equipment so that we can provide those samples for them to uh, take a look at and see what's been swimming through. And while we're there, of course, we also want to know what else is uh, around. So uh, these guys are sampling snow for perfluorinated chemicals, and these jackets are certified perfluorinated chemical free. In fact, all of their clothing has to be bought from sources that is uh, in order to be able to do that. Uh, and odd things happen when you work for Greenpeace. So these two people turned up, well, no, they were on board the ship anyway. I don't know if you recognise them, um, but uh, they were involved also in collecting some of the samples. This is uh, Marion Cotillard, um, who I know most famously from Inception, but apparently is best known for being um, uh, Edith Piaf. Uh, and this guy is Gustav Skarsgård. So if you're a, an, an aficionado of Vikings, uh, he's one of the main actors in Vikings, apparently. So there we go. When, when the samples come back and I analyse them, they've been collected by very prestigious people. So I'll finish there. Sometimes, working for Greenpeace, you can feel a little bit like a lone voice. Um, but I say increasingly not. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, the science is what's driving us, and that's always what's going to bring us back. So I'll leave it there and say, if you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you.